fructose actually turns off our appetite radar by interfering with the expression of a number of different hormones. So we know what we're up against. And that's why there's been such a backlash against sodas, because they were the first things identified as having a particularly and unusually high fructose content. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hilda Labradagor. This is episode 138, and my guest is Julia Ross. Julia is a pioneer in the use of innovative nutritional therapies for the treatment of eating disorders, addictions, and mood problems. She is the author of the best-selling books, The Mood Cure, The Diet Cure, and most recently, The Craving Cure. Julia oversees an entirely virtual clinic for food cravers, and she is the director of NNTI, the Neuro Nutrient Therapy Institute. Julia is an expert on the brain-craving connection, obviously. And today, she shares tools that help us identify what kind of cravers we are and how we got that way. She goes into some of the science behind the foods that we eat, why our brains tell us to go eat it, and how this leads us to the refrigerator eating ice cream around 11 p.m. This conversation offers fascinating insights that help us all understand our own relationship to food and cravings and the behavior of friends and family and respective food as well. Before we dive into the conversation, we want to recognize our sponsors. First and foremost, the foundation. The Weston A. Price Foundation has its annual conference coming up. We are so excited. It is in Baltimore in November this year, and we want you to be there. Find out more about the amazing offerings, the speakers, and the food that will be there at wisetraditions.org. By the way, I'll be there too, and I'm super excited. (laughs) Green Pasture also. Green Pasture products are inspired by the research of Dr. Weston A. Price. Traditional diets were much more rich in vitamins and nutrients than our diets today. That is why Green Pastures offers fermented cod liver oil, concentrated butter oil, and coconut oil in a variety of products and blends. Boost your health with wholesome, healthy Green Pasture products today. Go to greenpasture.org. And Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant, the probiotic everyone's talking about. Go to thriveprobiotic.com. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Julia. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be with you. You were telling me the story earlier of a woman, let's call her Carol, who was really struggling with cravings kind of her whole life long. She stumbled upon the Wise Traditions diet and made some changes, and yet she was still struggling. Tell us her story and tell us what happened. Well, she started out as a child sneaking food and gaining inappropriate weight, but it didn't really become a big struggle for her until she went off to college and had complete freedom to eat whatever she wanted. And these cravings got stronger and her intake of the high calorie foods that were, you know, really becoming popular at the time went over the top. She gained a hundred pounds over her optimal weight and she wasn't able to get rid of it. She tried dieting many times, very intelligent woman, very highly motivated, very uncomfortable carrying the weight physically and ashamed of having what you know amounts to an involuntary deformity. And then she found out about the Weston Price Foundation and she began to follow the dietary recommendations as much as possible. And over time, after a couple of years, she'd lost 50 pounds of the 100 pounds, and it had stayed off, unlike any of the other weight loss she'd ever had. That's amazing. But interestingly, as you pointed out to me a bit earlier, even on this wise traditions diet, even eating these whole, real, nourishing foods, somehow she couldn't kick certain cravings, right? That's right. And so fortunately, she noticed that my new book, The Craving Cure, had just been released. And got it and filled out the questionnaire, which is really the key to the whole craving elimination process that the book's about, and identified that she had three of the five types of cravings, and two of them were very severe. On a scale of zero to 10, she was tens on most of the symptoms. And she then 
went to the chapters that identified which brain targeted nutrients were needed for each of the particular craving types that she was struggling with and took them very methodically. One week she would take one and then the next week she added another one and finally the third week she added a third. And by the end of the third week, she was completely free of the cravings that were still haunting her so that her weight loss continued very naturally because she was one of these people who had a pretty good calorie burning capacity once she was able to eat whole traditional foods. Wow, I can't imagine the amount of relief she felt emotionally and physically. What a joy. So I want to find out more about the kind of cravers we are and the foods that can help us curb those cravings. But I want to back up first, Julie, and ask, how did we get here? How did we get so far removed from whole, real, nutrient-dense foods? Just by asking that question, you know, you reveal your knowledge of human culinary history. The truth is that we have had exquisite native appetites, you know, the ability to discern what foods when are needed to sustain us for arguably over a million years, up until a very specific time in history, which was not that long ago, and I'm talking about the 1970s. Prior to that, you know, when we look at crowd shots of Americans of every type and every age group, we see active, dynamic, and relatively slender people, mm -hmm. depending on their genetic stock. So in other words, we were eating according to our inborn instincts, and we were reaching a weight, a musculature, an eye color, and so forth that was predetermined by our genetic code. And we were doing a good job of it, even though we had started to introduce sugar in the 1900s. We had introduced trans fats in the 1930s. And in spite of that, because those things were limited in our diet, we continued to eat three square meals, which was a religious mantra in my growing up in the 50s, that's for sure, and had been learned from my grandmother by my mother, passed on to me. Uh, of course, we don't have the three meal concept anymore. And all that started the going out to eat really began in the 70s, it exploded in the 80s, along with our weight and an epidemic of eating disorders. By the 90s, we added an epidemic of diabetes. And by the early years of the 21st century, we had an epidemic of obesity, which all of these things have continued to increase in severity. So right now, we're struggling with 50% of us diagnosed with a form of diabetes. 50% in the 1960s, it was not quite 2%. We're talking about extraordinary changes in the human norm, appetite-wise and body-wise. But all of it began to escalate in the 1970s when our sugar source changed. We already knew that sugar was addictive, but we could kind of control it. We kept it as something that was only eaten after dinner, usually, or out. Our parents were very careful about it. They knew that it could take over and ruin our appetites, as they would say. Well, we've ruined our appetites, that's for sure. And that started in the 1970s when high fructose corn syrup, agave syrup, and fruit syrups, all of which have enormous amounts of fructose as opposed to glucose. And that's really made an enormous difference. This shift between a type of sugar that was 50% glucose, 50% fructose to now more like 60% fructose, 40% glucose at the best. We now know because we're analyzing actual bottles of soda, for example, and other products that there's been a lot of manipulation and fructose levels have gone even higher in many products. And fruit juice sweetened sodas are some of the worst in terms of this fructose poisoning, as I call it. Fructose, in a way, then, is almost like nicotine for cigarette smokers. The higher the percentage of fructose in our food, the more addictive it's going to be to us. That's a very good analogy. Fructose actually turns off our appetite radar by interfering with the expression of a number of different hormones. So we know 
what we're up against. And that's why there's been such a backlash against sodas, because they were the first things identified as having a particularly and unusually high fructose content. So what's important to know is that with high fructose syrups, they can manipulate the fructose glucose ratio any way they want. And there's no obligation to label it. So we don't really know what we're getting. And that's why it's been so important just in the last 10 years that some research by a researcher whose chair was actually funded by Dr. Atkins' widow, Michael Gorin at the University of Southern California, USC, has been actually analyzing the contents of various sodas and other food substances. Now he's gone into looking at fruit juice sweetened sodas because as soda pop has become the object of hatred by the health-minded, the soda companies have done a sidestep and they're putting out a lot of fruit juice sweetened sodas. Well, unfortunately, the kind of fruit juice concentrates that are being used are extremely high in fructose, even Mm -hmm. higher actually than some sodas. So his research, which is actually quite heroic because without the widow Atkins, he was not able to get his research funded Mm -hmm. because it was too challenging. He was actually going into the products themselves and reporting on things that were not on the label. But it's helped us tremendously to understand what we're up against. So we're craving sweets, and we're also craving carbs to a large degree. Is that right? Yes. That's another thing that happened in the 70s. Another fascinating development was that the kind of wheat we were growing, wheat being the most common carb by far consumed in the United States, mostly in the form of refined flour, and the new plant, a dwarf variety, was able to produce three times the amount of wheat that the traditional plants were producing and had produced up to that point. And so this type of wheat is actually spread all over the world because it's so much easier to grow, to harvest, and to sell. So we're actually consuming 35% more wheat flour products now than we were before 1970. And there are a lot of reasons for this. Even whole wheat products often have gluten added. Gluten is one of the components of wheat flour that helps to create that light, fluffy texture. And so a lot of it has been added to increase the delicious consistency and flavor of the wheat products that are available now. And of course, some people are sensitive to gluten. And so it's been hard on them. The incidence of celiac disease has increased over this time period. Is this why you say in your book that some carbs are twice as addictive as cocaine because they've been manipulated and as that has happened, it's increased our desire for those foods? Yes, absolutely. They've been manipulated right under our noses, literally. And part of the manipulation and the goal, by the way, of the industrial manipulation of foods has been to achieve as close as possible in as many products as possible to the ideal, which is the bliss point. And that is an addictive response by the brain, sort of an ultimate pleasure sensation that disrupts the normal pleasure experiencing capacity of the brain and creates this dependence and a need to reach that ultimate state of bliss over and over again. And one of the ways that they do it is to combine. So for example, we've got the new sugar and we've got the new wheat. So when we combine the two, it's exponentially much more potent than just a sweet product alone or just a baked bread product, for example, cookies, donuts. And when we also add other drug substances like chocolate, salt and fat, although essential to health and perfectly fine, when added at very high concentrations, especially combined with these other more addictive substances, more brain active substances, which the wheat and the sugar are the most brain active of these substances. But together, we get this compound effect, which I compare in the book to combining heroin and cocaine, which is considered to be the ultimate high. Coming up, Get ready to geek out on some of the science as Julia talks about the role that the brain plays in craving control. We want to pause now and recognize our sponsors, the Weston A. Price Foundation. We are committed to helping you and the world eat better. 
please come and join us at the Wise Traditions Conference this fall in Baltimore. It's November 16th to the 18th. We will have all of the excellent speakers and food you have come to expect with some new tracks with very specific health concerns that are addressed. The cancer track, then there's cooking, farming, the gut health track, and even an aging gracefully track. I seriously can't get over all that is being packed into this conference, not to mention the community and the lifelong friendships that stem from this. So there's no time like the present. Register today at wisetraditions.org. And Green Pasture Products. Green Pasture sells a variety of products to boost your health. Organic virgin coconut oil, virgin coconut ghee, skincare balms, and more. Their fermented cod liver oil comes from the prolonged soaking of wild cod livers in brine, which allows cod livers to naturally ferment. It's a gentle process compared to the process that is used by most highly industrialized cod liver oil manufacturers. Personally, I take their cod liver oil daily and I rarely get sick. I am so thankful for Green Pasture's thoughtful, traditional practices and products. Go to greenpasture.org and place your order today. And Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant. Most probiotic pills just pass through our bodies without achieving the desired effect. Just Thrive is the first 100% spore-forming probiotic that arrives alive in the intestines naturally. It supports optimal gut health, digestive health, immune health, and delivers antioxidants. It's great for adults, kids, the whole family. It's the probiotic everyone's talking about. Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant. Visit their website at thriveprobiotic.com. So let's talk a little bit more about the brain. You call it also in your book, the craving control central. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that our appetite, the pleasure we derive from food, when we want to eat, how much we want to eat, and what we want to eat, is determined in the brain. There are appetite regulating hormones as well that function in the body, but they're all interacting with this control center in the brain. And we didn't really know anything about the brain controls until neuroscience began to grow by leaps and bounds, you know, in the 1970s. And then in the 80s, their research was published. And we began to learn about what is it in the brain that gives us pleasure? And it turns out these very same cellular centers in the brain also are responsible for the transformation from a normal appetite to a craving appetite, an addicted state, mm -hmm. an addictive relationship with food. So as long as those cells are operating normally, we have a normal appetite and we can bypass most of the junk around us. But it's when that junk itself and our ingestion of it has reached a certain point and it's impacted the brain over and over that we begin to lose our natural controls. And the foods are so brain active now that, you know, this can happen in early childhood. By early childhood, by five years old, children screaming in the supermarket because they can't have whatever their poor little addicted brains require at that moment. Right. We see it right then and there in the early stages. Well, I do want to take it now, Julia, from the theoretical to the practical. And I know your book covers a lot of different types of cravers, so to speak. But let's go ahead and identify some of those so our listeners can see if they fall into any category. Can you go through the types of cravers there are and what characterize them by any chance? Absolutely. And I think it's important to say right now that there are only five types. It's not endless. And very few people have all five types of craving. And what that really means is that there are five types of pleasure generating cells in the brain called neurotransmitters that control our appetite. And when they are out of control, we have cravings and we can identify which set of cells is giving us this aberrant craving signal by a very well-defined but short list of symptoms. So it's actually easy to go through the questionnaire and identify which of the five craving types you have in just a few minutes. Neat. So once we understand what our neurotransmitters are asking for, we'll understand how to curb that craving. Yes, that's very well put. So first we have to identify how these neurotransmitters express themselves when they don't have what they need. And that's what the craving type questionnaire gives us in a list form. So the most common of the 
types of cravings are generated by our comfort chemistry. So the brain's endorphin output. So we know that endorphin is powerful chemical generated in the brain to produce sensations of enjoyment, pleasure, fun, all the things that we associate with chocolate, which is a food that really targets those endorphin producing cells. But other foods can do a great job of it too. Some people get a huge endorphin boost from bread and others from dairy products, perfectly healthy foods. But for them, for example, someone who's getting an endorphin boost from a dairy product, it's usually ice cream. So it's not just the dairy product, it's the sugar, typically chocolate, nuts, you know, all the added flavor and addiction enhancers. So let's take a look at the symptoms of a comfort craver. We've just talked about there are certain foods that are so good and their life isn't complete without the feeling of reward that they get when they finally get to ingest these foods. Some people think of them as their best friends. Chocolate is a particular favorite of type 3 comfort cravers. They are sensitive often to emotional and sometimes physical pain because they don't have natural production of endorphin to keep them more comfortable. That's why they look for it from these drug-like foods that temporarily fit into the same receptors in the brain that endorphin should be fitting into. So some of them tear up easily and even cry at commercials. We've discovered that many of them are tremendous animal lovers. And if you love animals, you know how loving they can be. I mean, they're exuding endorphins and they are tremendously comforting. So that can be a symptom. So the comfort craver is almost like the best friend feel that they get from their food of choice, whether it's chocolate or ice cream. What are some of the other type of cravers, Julia? Well, we have the crashed craver, and those are the hypoglycemic or low blood sugar cravers who find themselves out of control with sweets if they skip a meal or go too long between meals. They may or may not know that they have this condition, but many of them do know that they come from a family where people tend to have either hypoglycemia or diabetes, and their blood sugar regulation just isn't so strong, so they're vulnerable there. When that happens, they find it hard to concentrate, they can get irritable and feel overly stressed for no particular reason. Another of these common craving types is what I call the depressed craver, because these cravers tend to be using sugar and starch and the other addictive foods for relief of kind of a pessimism, particularly at night. The dark makes them feel like they need something to get back their sense of confidence about life and about themselves. They also tend to have difficulty getting to sleep. So many of them are these nighttime starch cravers. For example, it's very common for us to get clients at our clinic who eat bowls and bowls of cold cereal at night. They're not interested in the morning, but at night they really feel the need of it. So they can be anxious as well as sort of depressive and sleepless. Some find themselves hyperactive. You know, they just can't get that nice, calm sense of peace in life. So they're looking for an emotional relief from food of that type. So it sounds like a lot of these cravers are actually looking for a sense of peace, comfort, and relief through these choices that they're making. That's right. There is, though, a significant group of cravers who are looking for the opposite. So these cravers are looking for caffeinated, dark chocolate, pure sugar, whatever gives them a jolt of energy. So the reason for Starbucks popularity is combining caffeine with all that sugar and chocolate and so forth. But some people actually get the same jolt of energy and talk about this. You know, I can't keep going unless I'm eating M&Ms all day or I'm sucking on some kind of candy all day. But typically this fatigued craver is looking for energy from food rather than peacefulness and relief from stress. But the stress craver is a particular type of craver, and there's been a lot of research on how many people overeat when they're stressed, and they find that about 70% do. There's 30% who don't eat at all when they're stressed. You know, they're too stressed to want to even swallow anything. But a lot of people eat because of stress chemistry in the brain. So the part of the brain that should, every once in a while, release some adrenaline to help us deal with something stressful is 
in the kind of life that we live now is always producing. Many of us easily become overstressed and the majority of us when we're overstressed are turning to these snack foods, flavored sugar and starch basically, to give us a little bit of relief. And that does it. That's all five types. Wow. Well, so we've identified our craving type probably by now in the show. And we still need to talk about how we can curb those cravings. So Julia, I think we're going to have to do a part two, because this is deep, amazing content. And we want to give people not just the first step, but the whole idea on how to go about curbing these cravings. Do you agree? I do agree. (laughs) I thought you would. (laughs) No, but seriously, like this is great. And I just don't want to take the listeners just part of the way. So let's do a part two on this. And this has been valuable information. And we want our listeners, before they listen to part two, to go ahead and identify what kind of cravers they are. I understand they can take the questionnaire online and we can put that link in our show notes. Does that sound good, Julia? That's a great idea. Cravingcure.com. They can easily find a questionnaire. Awesome. So now I'm going to ask you the question I often pose at the end of the show. If the listener could do one thing to improve their health, Julia, what would you recommend that they do? Well, this is giving away the solution that we're going to get into in depth in part two, but I would say increase their protein intake. Oh, that's still good. And people are going to want to hear more about that. So thank you (laughs) so much for your time today, Julia. I look forward to talking to you again. Well, thank you. Likewise, look forward to talking to you soon. My guest today was Julia Ross. To connect with Julia, go to juliarosscures.com. For the show notes and highlights from today's episode with links to the resources we mentioned, just go to our website, westonaprice.org, and look for the show notes for episode 138. If you are enjoying this podcast, go ahead and subscribe through Apple Podcasts so you don't miss a thing. You can also rate and review us there. Every review lets people know that this show is worth listening to. Thank you in advance for doing that. And for every time that you share on social media how much Wise Traditions means to you. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Weston A. Price for updates on ancestral health topics. And you can also look for us on Facebook, the Weston A. Price Foundation. Next week, everybody, we get to hear from Julia again. This is part two. And we're not just going to identify what kind of cravers we are, but we're going to talk about practical steps we can take to curb those cravings. And I'll give you a little hint right now. Willpower has nothing to do with it. Finally, a big thank you to my friends at Podcast Village, to Rob Ford, Charlie Burney, and also the team of interns who help us with this show. Cynthia Castro Cohen Enriquez, Joy de los Santos, Deirdre Beard, Diva Rizvi, Melanie Hearn, Mary Hine, Cheryl Huftelin, and Olga de Villiers. Our listening team includes Heather Carpentier and Victor Cosetto, and Amy Marvin helps us with transcriptions. Last but not least, give me your feedback. Let me know what you thought of today's episode or give me ideas for future shows. I'm on Twitter at Holistic Hilda. I'm also on Instagram at Holistic underscore Hilda. Or just visit my website, HolisticHilda.com so I can support you on your wellness or podcasting journey. Thanks, everybody, and keep on listening. Did you know that there are Weston A. Price Foundation chapters all over the U.S. and around the world? Chapter leaders help you find good food in your area, and some have meetings you can attend. Go to our website, westonaprice.org, and click on Find a Local Chapter to see if there is one near you. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food Farming in the Healing Arts. The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice. 